We've got some big news with regard to the United Auto Workers ongoing strike against the big three automakers. So uh, put this up on the screen. Joe Biden making a big announcement last week under pressure, both from within his own party, but also uh, from the Republicans and the fact that Trump is going to Michigan. He announced that this Tuesday, that would be tomorrow, I will go to Michigan to join the picket line and stand in solidarity with the men and women of UAW as they fight for a fair share of the value they help create. It's time for a win-win agreement that keeps American auto manufacturing thriving with well-paid UAW jobs. Put the next piece up on the screen. So as far as we know, this is actually the first time that a sitting president has ever gone to stand in solidarity with workers at a picket line. Uh, I was talking to Jeff Stein at the Washington Post. He has been talking to labor historians to find out if there's any precedent for it. Um, no one quite knows 100% for sure. Yeah. But, you know, that seems to be an indication that this probably never happened before. What they keep saying is at least in 100 years this hasn't happened. Maybe something happened earlier in the history of the republic. But you would think it would be, have been a big enough deal even at that time for there to be some sort of news and recording of the event. So as far as we know, this is the first time a sitting president has walked a picket line. Per Mother Jones, they say it's not unusual for politicians to walk a picket line. Candidates often make a point of dropping by with donuts and coffee. In 2020, Bi Biden did march outside the Palms in Las Vegas with casino workers, but no sitting president has ever walked a picket line with striking workers. They have historically been much more prone to extravagant shows of solidarity with the companies that are trying to break those strikes. And they recall that in 1894, Grover Cleveland sent 2,000 federal troops to Chicago to break a railroad strike. Um, Biden has yet to announce exactly where in Michigan he will be, but they say it's a safe bet that wherever he ends up going, the National Guard, thankfully, will not be coming with him. So this is a huge deal. Um, it really is, there's no way to sort of oversell this. Uh, Democrats had increasingly been pushing him to go. You'd already had a number of Democratic politicians, including John Fetterman and Ro Khanna and other local uh, Michigan representatives who had shown up on the picket line, especially after Trump announced that he, on debate night, is going to give a speech to union workers past and present. Um, I think they felt increasing pressure that Biden needed to, you know, do a little more and be a little visible to stake his claim that he is the person who is really, truly standing alongside these workers. And so looks like this is going to happen, which is pretty extraordinary. Yeah, you know, so I also looked into it in terms of the history. Everyone keeps saying 100 years, uh, but I've been trying to look past and, and think about the major labor era. I also cannot really think, even the best friends of labor who were in the White House, people like FDR. Yeah. Well, FDR, for obvious reasons, not going to be joining a picket line. Uh, but, uh, you know, in terms of issuing uh, statements of support and all of that, the other reason why politically I think this is a very smart move is that there are six 66,000 UAW workers, Crystal, in the state of Michigan, just in Michigan. Yeah. So that's 66,000 people who are organized and they like to vote, a lot of these union folks. So we should not forget, why did Mitt Romney blow Michigan so badly back in 2012? Because of the 2000, either eight or nine op-ed that he wrote, which is said, let Detroit go bankrupt. Yeah. That was plastered all over the state and he lost it by a massive margin. And then all of a sudden, Trump comes around and wins this state by a fraction of a point in 2016. That is one of the craziest things that has ever happened. Well, why did Trump win it? Because A, a lot of people stayed home, a lot of urban voters who did not feel excited by Hillary, and he split the union vote by a pretty historic margin for a, a Republican presidential candidate. And it was largely on talk of Lordstown. It was talk of GM. It was talk of NAFTA. And it was specifically speaking to a lot of these people concerned. So one of the reasons why I think that this is actually a net benefit is we finally have two candidates who are courting union workers in the state of Michigan, which is a complete inversion from the Obama era. Like, I'm kind of with you, you know, but I'm still embracing NAFTA, free trade, and all this other right. stuff, which is screwing you as opposed to Romney, he's like, no, 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 I literally want to see you die and collapse. Um, so to see that inversion is, uh, and of course, look, it's all in rhetoric, but you know, rhetoric at least precedes something, usually. Uh, to see that happen, I think, is a very is a very net benefit to the country. Um, Trump, in terms of his record as president, as you guys know, was a horrific union buster. There's no doubt about it. However, I do think the fact that he rhetorically approaches these issues, 
in a different, at least giving sort of like token or symbolic gestures towards the plight of the workers, I think has changed public sentiment. Okay, because, yeah. you know, back under the Obama era, there was a really hard divide about how Republicans versus Democrats felt about unions. Right. And there's still a split. I mean, Democrats are still way more favorable towards unions, towards labor, towards these strikes in particular than Republicans are. But you now consistently have polls that show Republican, the Republican base, not the elites who still continue to be union busters overwhelmingly, but the Republican base showing support for unions and standing on the side of striking workers. Um, I think that the rhetorical shift, even though, again, in terms of the record, it's total bullshit, but in the rhetorical shift, I think, has opened up a space among the Republican base, combined with the fact, I mean, the pandemic changed everything. Of course it did. You know, the yeah. pandemic really changed the way people were thinking about this. We all lived under the specter of seeing these corporations making literally record-breaking profits and then using the excuse of inflation just further price gouge everyone. And so, you know, that kind of changed the way people feel about these labor disputes. So not only is it smart because Biden is kind of one-upping Trump here in terms of what he's actually doing. Trump isn't speaking directly to the auto workers. There isn't any expectation he's going to walk the picket line. All his rhetoric has been on the one hand, like I sort of in theory support the workers and screw electric vehicles. On the other hand, like this kind of anti-union, union boss, traditional Republican language. So it's not only smart from that perspective, but also, you know, it's not just the union workers who stand on the side of the union workers. You have something like 75 percent of the public that is on the side of the workers over the bosses in this dispute. So it is not that's why this is so politically safe for him and why it's such an extraordinary moment that created the conditions where even someone who's been this lifelong, like, you know, centrist, moderate kind of a guy can do something that, again, is, in terms of history, truly extraordinary and has, as far as we know, literally never happened before. One reason I know that the political dynamics have changed is back in the 2010s era, uh, there was an entire GOP, like, media ecosystem dedicated to, like, attack. Remember the whole Scott Walker thing? Like, of course. Like, the Scott Walker. Yeah. Attack the teachers, teacher pay, all that other stuff. I don't see any of that right now. Like in terms of Twitter and YouTube and GOP, like where like base media, they're not consuming anti-union content. It doesn't even exist. It doesn't register. But A, I think that's two things. One is obviously the base has moved long past or they agree. You know, in many cases, a lot of these people culturally are very much with the Republican Party. So it's a little bit, it gets a little, you know, queasy if you're trying to attack their overall economic demands. But as you said, Trump has just moved on from that. He's pushed a lot of the people, the most MAGA type influencer. I I have not seen one single individual, like Charlie Kirk, Jack Posobiec, any of these folks attack the UAW strike. If anything, they've posted stuff. Ben that Shapiro is, has. Well, as see, he's has. different. Shapiro <laughs> yeah, is. A, I mean, he's not Shapiro a Trump guy. is not a Trump guy. He is an OG member of the Tea Party, the Libertarian fact. I mean, remember, he was attacking Trump for being too liberal back in 2016. So I would not put yeah, Shapiro just, in that. Whatsoever. I'm just saying there is yeah. still some union busting conservative totally. media out there. So it's not like it's all gone. But the moment is very different from. I mean, Scott Walker. In yes. that moment, that, that was, was totally like the different. conservative cause celeb. Exactly. Chris Christie right. came to Republican conservative prominence from like yelling at teacher unions and being super anti union in the state of New Jersey. And so it was a very, very different moment energy wise within the Republican Party, even as, you know, the, the policy in terms of what they actually do when they're in government hasn't changed. But the rhetoric, the attitude, what's like the beating heart of the Republican movement has definitely in terms of where the like online energy yeah. is, has has definitely radically shifted. And, you know, that does create a, a real opening for working people, which is part of what we're seeing and part of, again, what I think is like one of the most hopeful stories in the entire country at this point. Hey guys, if you like that video, go to breakingpoints.com, become a premium subscriber and help us build the best independent media organization on the planet. That's right, we're subscriber funded, we're building something new, we wanna replace these failing mainstream media organizations. So again, to subscribe, it's breakingpoints.com.